Welcome to the Lesbo and the Bean universe. Lesbo and the Bean. L-A-T-B. Lat B. Where mixed martial arts and the UFC get silly. Big silly. Buckle up and move your tray tables to their upright position. And please, somebody shut that baby up. It's time for Lesbo and the Bean. Welcome back. Welcome back. Episode 151. We got a fight night out of Denver. Here we go, Lesbo. We're going to have many weeks on the way, full November and December. How have you been since we last met? Pretty groovy. Pretty Landau. There has been a ton of info coming out, ton of interviews coming out. Um, before we get into the heavy duty 13 card breakdown that we're going to have out of Denver, a little bit of news to go over. For me, the talk of the town what hasn't about always been. spread? Feeling Venata. <laughs> Two draws in his career. <laughs> is it? But it's just groovy, he's groovy. Yeah, and that would be such an inside inside only for the hardcores. How um, many out of you out there are feeling Venata? <laughs> so, Venata doing well, coming back from his last loss, but uh, not even lost. Draw, second draw that he's had in his career in the UFC. So, unique few that he's in the in there with. Other unique few. Ben Askren has been making his rounds now on social media, talking a lot of crap. Uh, Ariel had a stellar show, probably one of his best of the year, I would say, with as many controversial figures as he had on. He had, who we've talked about here a few times, Ali the Rat Abdelaziz, go on there and actually have a very heated exchange. Did you happen to catch any of that? No. Oh. Do tell. Ariel kept trying to ask Ali to talk about his terrorist supposed terrorist ties and claims and to just come out and tell people he's not a terrorist and Ali would say I don't have to say anything about that because it's not I'm suing people I'm not going to talk about it but um again we've said it before you can look really quickly into his past and he has a lot of faked passport situations and a lot of ties Ali does to extremist groups that have done bad stuff in other countries that's just the ties he has, not me. I'm just reporting what I've seen. So Ariel was doing really well and actually being really confrontra confrontational, telling Aziz, why are you blocking me and talking crap? You are trying to influence the media. And Ali immediately backstepped on everything. Immediately took a, took a step back on everything and was like, okay, we're good, Ariel. But uh, just a really interesting dynamic of how Ali also says that he's not- Ariel or Ariel and Chael or both? No, Ariel and- Ali Abdelaziz. Oh, okay. The I didn't promoter. know if you were saying Ali and Chael. I don't oh, know why sorry. I was thinking Chael the whole time. Oh, I, sorry, it might no, have no. just been me. It might have just been That's me. his Ariel and the bad guy. Did it podcast. get religious at all between Ariel it and It was, Ali? and they went into the religion aspect Oof. nonstop because of Connor and Kavanaugh. And that's where Ali was saying this all started with Judge or Coach Kavanaugh <laughs> talking about <laughs> Wrong podcast. <laughs> well, kind of. Yeah. So talking about uh, what the profit that they li like and whatever over there. So the fact that they brought it up, that's where they cross boundaries. And Speaking of, we're going to be having a drawing contest on our show. I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. JK. No, MMA fans I can be fickle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they can also be fickle the other way where people that never listened before be like, I'll have a drawing contest. That's a Patreon move. <laughs> I could see that. But either way, I really recommend it. Sarge Eubanks made an appearance as well after her missing weight and uh, talking about how Ben Askren talked to her in the back and said, you got to make weight. And she was like, you ain't going to swing on me, so you better leave me alone. Oh, my. She's taking full she heel. She doesn't take any role. of the... And, hey, lady, take all... You have these amazing people around you, and you might be able to go to any of their camps. They might welcome it. You ain't the best. Take advantage of this shit. She doubled down on her time of the month claim as well. I know you definitely are fond of that tactic. Doubled down hard on it and it was just like, I don't care if you guys know. But, uh... This she... is... I cannot wait to hear <laughs> what Valentina Shevchenko has to say about that. What Joanna Janjacek has to say about that. What Rose Nama Yunus has to say about that. What Claudia Gadelia has to say. It's like, lady, there is friggin' women way better than you that are in this sport right now that I have never heard them make that excuse. So please, 
please. And um, you just happen every single one of your fights. Is it during that time of the month? Because you've missed weight on every one. Well, that's the thing. She thinks that she deserves a title shot, but more than likely she's not going to get one. She's going to punch so. me when I see her. That might happen. That's cool. We got lawyers. She's getting yeah. paid. She was talking about how she's getting paid. Oh, good. Good, good, good. <laughs> but for Sarge, she's one of the few women that uh, is taking that heel role. I would say she's in the top, for me personally, with Magania and Jessica I. I that's company. agree that's, with you. That's I, three's company Jessica right there. I is becoming one of my more favorite ladies at 125. Yeah. Honestly, at 125. Honestly, I got to say that as well, that out of those fighters that I spoke of, uh, Jessica I is turning to the good, if to the better I side. If Jessica I were to listen to this show, and this was the first show <laughs> After she, she unblocks us, to, <laughs> she would have to unblock us and then just not listen to previous shows because we have hated, but I'm starting to... She once you start around. backing up your shit... I, I like that, and I just think she's getting smarter about the way she's playing things, even calling out Eubanks before the fight. Totally. Smart move, I think. And I think I is Eubanks' next fight. So, and Eubanks, as well, talking about how she started to cut. She was about a pound and a half, and then she was having trouble, but not that much trouble, but she was worried about the commission pulling her completely so that she wouldn't fight at all. So she stopped cutting an hour and a half before. She didn't even try. The first time was the last time she weighed on where that's why a lot of people were like, what is going on? To me, what that says is what we harp on here is these people stop cutting so that they're better in the fight. So she was better in the fight and still completely gassed. Just saying. Noticing 135, stuff. Eubanks. And that's where I'm like, I don't understand how she's even contemplating staying at 125. Because she's like, I, I think 25 is my division. It's not. You haven't made weight for a title fight. It's not your division. It's not your division, lady. And go up. Go up. She is a champion in Jiu-Jitsu World's Gi competition at 162 pounds. Go 135 up. is your weight class, wombs. Go up. Sorry. Go up. It's time to go. You know what we never talked about on air? Um, what was the that? The most touching thing... Brennan Schaub's son having... Uh, Epilepsy? Yeah, a form of... Best case scenario would be if it's the kind of epilepsy that you grow out of, the specific name for Which it. Which it happens to a lot of kids. A lot of kids. In my family, my twin brother, evil twin himself, was an epileptic. And back in those days, all they had was hardcore drugs. That they're like, we'll see if this works. Uh, evil twin got a little extra evil at times in there but now with all this cbd stuff and all this new technology i'm like i ain't even that scared of epilepsy and so they he got is getting sent he has connections to get the best cbd oil exactly um for his kid and um just a little update very emotional and he's always been <laughs> honest with his fans and if you i know a lot of people hate on him and if you watch below the belt he is like huge softy and then especially talking about his kid which is an obvious but brennan is like an extra softy um, and then he had an update on fighter and the kid, which if he were going to have a seizure, it would have been the time because he was in the eight to 10 day window. Yep. And I think he was at like the 11 or 12 day mark and he hadn't had a seizure. That's why I feel like this day and age, it's a little scary, but not what it was 20 years ago, even 20 so, years ago. They couldn't, there was Depico and other narcotics that they're just like, here, maybe they'll grow out of it. Maybe not, but here's this medication that's going to jack them up. Yeah, I just, um, yeah, I'll keep you guys posted, but uh, definitely, I think reaching out to him, I think he got a whole, like, 100% love from fans, too, oh, which is a big, right, right usually it's 50 50, right a lot of so. trolls. So, yeah. very cool, very honest moment. Hopefully, everything goes well. And beforehand, with him and his I think, you know, there were signs going on and symptoms that maybe he, but he just seems like a good guy anyway. He actually reached out to um, Ray Borg, who's later on on the card. Yeah, he yep. actually reached out and to Ray Borg and was like, I will pay whatever. I'm not just talking shit and I'm not just trying to get attention. I'm really saying that. Call me. I'm a millionaire. I want to help you out. And I, you That's know, dope. yeah, dad's helping dads. Exactly. Dad's helping dads. Talking about the fight card out of Denver. You know the weed's going to be flowing. You know the CBD's going to be high in the room. These fighters are going to have a contact high. Their brutality might be on the next level because... They're going to get punched in the head and be like, I didn't even feel that. I can't even feel my face. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. 
feet, my face. It starts off from the bottom of the top. This is a sneaky good card. This is a sneaky good card. There's a double, a dreaded double debut in here. A couple other fun ones. Uh, there's some underdogs I'm liking. A lot of money to be made. I feel like this is a bet-friendly night, not only on DraftKings, which we have the lines out for already. Also, betting-wise, your props are going to be heavy. So many fun fighters. I can't wait to get there. From the bottom to the top, we're starting at 125 pounds. Flyweight division, we have Mark De La Rosa versus Jacoby Sanchez. 11-1 Jacoby Sanchez was a long time. Uh, talked about coming into the scene. Winning his contender weary series fight. There's a lot of contender series debuts on this card out of Denver as well. It is going to be on your Fox Sports. So look on your local listings in order to BT3 it now, I think it is, in the UK. And just in case you need to know what station it's to get it Backing on. out. Yep. Is BT3 the new ESPN too? Is that the affiliate with ESPN? Uh, I'm not sure because it's UK standards, but I know that on my feed, just BT3 is where I see fights now. Just saying. BT2 and 1 ain't working no more. <laughs> <laughs> then De La Rosa has already had a fight in the UFC. He's had a couple, I believe, actually. He lost his debut against Tim Elliott via submission short notice 10 months ago, but has come back and beat Elias Garcia three months ago via rear naked choke. Both of these guys, young in their careers, Jacoby, again, has those accolades as a good wrestler at 27 years old coming out of Jackson Wink. You know that there's going to be a really interesting BMF Wink connection. Maybe uh, more of a clashing of heads going on. This isn't one of those, but we're going to see a lot of Winkle John uh, burp, Jackson burp, burp. fighters. In this fight, Sanchez is a good grinder, good all-around fighter. Both of them are. Standing-wise, I give the slight advantage to Sanchez in the technical striking ability, but Rosa has a little more power to me. I like what I see from both of these guys. They both have good gas tanks at 125. On the ground, I also think that De La Rosa is a sneakier submission fighter. I just saw his transitions being a little more unique in there. But you know that's wrestling for me, which Jacoby Sanchez has, will neutralize a lot of that. I see this being a super close fight. It's a let be, stay away all day, everywhere. I think Jacoby Sanchez, like last week, is a sneaky underdog. Is and it I'm gonna Joby? Go. It is Joby. Sorry, I'm thinking Jacoby Sanchez is a different fighter. Joby Sanchez. There was a Jacoby Sanchez who's already retired out of the That's too USC. many Sanchez's. Way too many. That gets Especially dirty. out of Colorado. That Diego was hanging dirty. out in there as well. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to go with the underdog. I had the Lima last week. People called me crazy. I think Sanchez can actually grind this out to a boring decision. I like both of these fighters moving forward, but I got underdog starting off my night. Who do you have in this one? Oh, he's an underdog. Oh, yeah. Dela, or uh, Sanchez. I have De La Rosa submission round two. I agree. This is a lap B stay away. Mark De La Rosa has okay hands to me, and he just jumps into his submission so fast, there's nothing anyone can do about him. So I even think the reverse wrestling to keep it standing, it just happens so fast. It just happens so fast if it's going to happen. And I don't think Joby Sanchez has hard enough hands that I'm worried about um, Mark getting KO'd or anything like that. So I'm staying far, far away from this fight because I'm going to try to stick with what I know and I don't know shit about these guys. Good call, good call. DraftKings 9,000 for Rosas against Jacoby's, or sorry, Joby's 7,200. Are you going to play Rosas on your DraftKings? That's pretty high. He needs a finish first round in order to really pay that off. Mm, maybe one. Maybe. I could. I don't see it going the distance, though. So I don't see myself playing Sanchez anywhere. Maybe De La Rosa. Like I was saying earlier on. No, I'm going to stick with what I know. I'll probably stay far away from this. Stay far away from it. If you want to be a renegade and a rebel... As the bean here, you're going to go two underdogs starting off your fight cards two weeks in a row. Get all mad, Max. Get all mad, Max. I'm not going to play this heavy on my DraftKings, but I'm going to rotate a couple of these lower fighters. Sanchez will be one of them to let me get some of these 9495 guys because they're up there this week on DraftKings. Then we move on to the flyweight division we're gonna stay at the flyweight division with eric shelton versus joseph morales is this the last night of flyweights do you think 
That, I was wondering that because of the DJ stuff we've Is been talking about. everybody moving up? Moving on up. We'll see. Well, they're getting a few premier fights in here, so they're still making bouts at 125. I don't see them moving the division. And these are all young guys. All these guys are in their mid to early 20s. They ain't 30, 40 years old. They got 135, 45, 55 even to move up to potentially. Some of them will stay down here. Eric Shelton might be one of those guys being a little vertically challenged. At both of them being 5'6". Um, Joseph Morales being 9-1. and one, Getting his debut loss against Davician Figueroa nine months ago. He was kind of fed to the wolves there a little bit, I would say. Uh, Morales came in debuting against, to me, what a top 10 fighter, maybe even top 8 in Figueroa, Figueroa right now. Eric Shelton also coming in and having multiple fights, being 11-5, and five, coming out of, I think he has MMA. It says core fitness, but I think he has lab ties as well I, I, out of that Portland scene. He's had split decisions with Pantoja, with Jared Brooks lost a split decision, beat Lausa, who's no longer in the UFC, and coming off of a loss to Alex Perez, who is one of the biggest thieves, weasels as they call them, in the sport. Alex Perez squeaks out decisions nonstop, but that's also what we say here about Eric Shelton. He fights to the potential of his opponent and is in the split decision fights because he will do just enough to get the takedown maybe at the end of the round, but will not really do much. He has a lower output in his strikes, and his striking defense is good, but this to me just has stay away written all over it. I have Eric Shelton being slightly better than Morales everywhere, even on the ground, and I see this being a decision. I see it being just pretty much a wrestling match. I don't see either fighter knocking each other out here. They don't have that type of striking background. So I'm going Shelton. I'm... Staying so far clear from here. I have Shelton decision as well, and I'm staying far away from it. I think this fight is going to be so close. If if there's a dirty split, Eric Shelton's going to do it. 100%. I think it's going to happen. Um, so I got Shelton eking out a decision. I think all the competition and all the losses that he's had before this were against guys that were like 11 and 0, 12 and 0, 13 and 1, like huge records, big um, contenders. So. For Eric Shelton, I think he could have been one of those guys and then just happened to get a really rough record. Like, really... Totally. Rough. Pantoja. Yeah, freaking... and I think it was Pantoja in Brazil, and he looked beefed out of his mind. <laughs> yeah. I'm yep. not sure, but I'm pretty sure Pantoja does never fight out of Brazil. <laughs> like, that MF is huge. So, I got Shelton decision. I think he ekes it out, and um, they're small guys. He should be able to lay a lot of points. Tell me the cost. It is 8,200 for the slight favorite at minus 120. Eric Shelton against 8,000. Morales, I think that's spot on. Yeah, what's the lines. average points for Shelton? Shelton is up 46.8 points against a 56 for the one time, two time showing, two time showing Morales. Morales also right. beat Roberto Sanchez via submission, but again, I don't see him coming So even in Eric doing Shelton that. losing has a high, he's getting 80 points. Average and look at he has four losses. No, no, no. In the last five. He's getting forty six point eight. Oh, I thought you said eighty six. No, forty six. Like, Damn. Sorry, sorry. Forty six point eight. So yeah, that's pretty low. So, yeah, but still forty six for eight thousand. Um, the last five of your fights, you lost four, so he never got that twenty point averaged in. Yeah, right. Good point. He doesn't get those little yeah. bonuses. I'm staying away from it too. I'm staying away from it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just don't see it a big being a big uh, discrepancy either way for either fighter. Moving on to the 55ers, we have a profile fight. This is a former contender in the one of the latest tough houses with John Gunther against Davi Ramos, who's 8-2. John Gunther being 7-0, but losing all three of his fights in the fight house. Those don't transfer over because they're considered exhibitions. So Gunther huh. is on a three-fight losing streak. I'm just saying. Most of those being submissions, the ones that weren't was... He, was Gunther getting picked apart worse than anybody I've ever seen? Not worse than anyone I've ever seen, but it's up there. Jonathan, Jonathan Gunther's striking offense and defense is very low caliber. I want I don't want to be ultra brutal because he is UFC caliber fighter submission-wise and um, heart-wise. Gunther does not ever fold in there. He took short notice fights on the house after getting beat up. 
attribute to his toughness, but his takedowns are garbage. He pushes you up against the fence and tries to drag you down to get you on the ground. But even in the house, he was out submitted and out ground on the ground. And that's what he does. So Davi Ramos coming in, getting multiple fights of the nights already in here, coming off a two fight winning streak. We know what we get with Ramos. Heavy, humongous strikes and world champion Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. So... So you're not good on the ground. You're not better than him on the ground and striking your... Some of the lowest striking defense I've ever seen in there. I see this being such a one-sided fight. Everyone sees it. The minus 700 favorite, Davi Ramos. One of the biggest favorites of the night. Rightfully so. I'm putting Ramos wherever I can. Because this is a TKO submission round number one. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. I'm not joking here. This is a squash match. Gunther doesn't deserve to be in the UFC. I love Gunther's personality, and I really like him as a person. But he's not UFC. He's a jiu-jitsu guy. He needs to be on the jiu-jitsu scene. I have Davey Ramos submission round one. So I agree with you. I think you put him everywhere. He seems, it's hard for me to imagine that he's even fighting at 155. He seems he, like such an enormous guy he's a in thick there. dude. So, yeah. huh. I got Davey Ramos. So. Submission round one. Put him where you can. 9,500 against 6,700 for Gunther. Gunther absolutely nowhere. Ramo, don't even think about it. Don't even try to mess up your card thinking like, ooh, sneaky wage gauge. There is no wage gauge. Low output, low takedown defense. It, worldwide, I think Davey Ramos should be ranked a little closer to the top. He's ranked 51 in the world. I think this is right too. John Gunther, 185 in the world. Yep. Minus 950. Davey Ramos against plus 625 for Gunther. Everybody sees it. Is this going to be, though, a highly owned fighter on DraftKings? Or do the casuals not know why this is big of a favorite? Do they play with the cards? I mean, is this one of those, like, 30% everybody has them? Hmm. I think he might be up there where, like, 60% of the people own him. Yeah, right? So then, is it better to not? have as much exposure to him because there might be other people. He we might have be the guy you have to have on your card to be at the top because he might have that, like, 120 score. I could see that 120 score in this type of mm-hmm. fight easy. Mm-hmm. Or I could see a 102 score where it's literally a takedown into a submission. So it's the 90 points with two-point takedown. Like, it could be that quick of a fight where it doesn't yeah. get up there. If you can afford him, play him. See where you can play him. On to... But the casuals aren't going to know about Davey Ramos. <laughs> or Gunther. Hopefully they don't know how bad Gunther really is. Hopefully they just like Gunther's mustache. <laughs> <laughs> On to Julian Erosas versus Devontae Smith. This is one of those dreaded double debuts. I don't know if dreaded is in there necessarily because we have had a bit of exposure. Both of these fighters coming off of the Contender Series making their debuts in the UFC. We do have a bit of information on them. Um, But again, we're seeing some of these guys coming out of the Contender Series aren't fighting UFC caliber fighters in there. They're just fighting somebody on tape so that UFC is like, oh, okay. And Erosas tends to like to keep it striking. He is 22 and 5. Definitely a Muay Thai striker. Head movement, a little suspect in there. Ended up going back and watching not only their Contender Series fights, but a couple before. Was able to find tape on both of them. And Devontae Smith is that dreaded black explosive that I was talking about our last episode. Where he is a very athletic young man. Beautiful. Um, he got that round jab, one cardio. But he has that round one cardio. He can On the second round that I saw him come out, he has a good burst for 30 seconds. But then tapers off very quickly. If Smith flurries in there and tries to get you out and you survive through you're going to be able to beat this gentleman i like smith's jab what i don't like about smith's striking at times in there is he's so confident his hands are low and when he throws his jab out instead of retreating and covering it up right away he leaves it straight out like a sparring match and i saw him doing that in the contender series fight so i think that's going to happen here against erosis and erosis is a sneaky muay thai fighter Again, his output is just really, really low. Take down the fence really low, and he's hittable. Devontae Smith can knock him out in here. Devontae Smith can also gas in the second and third round, and Erosas has that type of grit that he can take it there. 
I don't think Rosas does it. I think this is another spot where we see Devontae Smith get a round two finish. I think it's early in round number two. I think Erosas gets pummeled in there, maybe survives. Could see a late round number one for Smith as well, but these guys are really low caliber. Do not put a ton of hype. Whoever wins this fight. I actually have Erosa um, being able to... I. <laughs> I don't know anything about it. I'm going to stay far, far, far away from this fight. I shouldn't even pick it on my tapology, honestly. <laughs> I shouldn't even let it ruin that. Um, so I don't. I need to stay far, far away from it. I need to remember to on my um, DraftKings card as well. Both guys, in my opinion, can knock out the other guy. I think they're going to go in there too hungry, too emotional, too everything. Here's something about Julian that I was wondering. <laughs> is he going to have any power at all at 155? He's moving up in weight. Or I think he was huge. The few fights I did see him at, I, I thought he was fighting at 55 already. And I was surprised to see at 45. So I'm thinking this is one of those things. Because he's still at 29 years old. Like he was packed with muscle. That could have been why he also looked fairly slow and sluggish in there. He might have killed himself for some of those prior fights. But again... Caliber of fighter he was fighting, low caliber. Same with Smith. He had a couple guys quit, just flat out quit, because they just were, weren't as big of athletes as Smith. It wasn't that it was anything specifically that amazing. Uh, I don't know enough about him. I got a Rosa uh, da, da, KO round three. Wow. Do you think that this matters at all? We have a local, semi-local, in Smith, being out of Colorado, against the Yakima, Washington native. I mean, what Yakima has an underground, sneaky MMA scene. People don't know. But so does Colorado. So do BMF, all those guys. And at elevation. Yeah, is that going to also, for real, help with that cardio? So, that We do need to take that into consideration for the night. In Denver, the Mile High City itself, we've seen guys gasp. All the time, we like to think, oh, they should know by now. They don't know by now. They don't know by now. And I'm trying to look back now and think, is this going to change any of my picks up until this point? (laughs) Because some guys that I was worried about, their cardio going into it. I don't think so. Mm. 9,100 on DraftKings. I'm switching to Smith. I like that he's from Colorado. I could see that as well. 9,100 on DraftKings against 7,100. I'm not going to play Smith heavy here. I'm going to put them on a few cards. Erosa's not too many at all. Maybe one or two just contrarian plays. Um, but 9-1 for two untested fighters. There's other spots where the finishes are coming. Agree. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Agree. On to another lightweight fight. Have you fight. noticed from the bottom to the top is everywhere lately? Oh, it's been everywhere for a while. Oh. I don't think we, uh, yeah, I don't think we're the only ones. Thank you, though. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. Well, that's the only time I ever heard it. Then the Bottom to the top. So we stay at the 55ers again. We have Benil Dariush coming in in essentially a three-fight losing streak against debuting Tiago Moyes. Moyes? I don't want to pronounce that wrong. I'm still looking Moises. at it. So the 11-2 and two debut UFC fighter Moises. had his Moises. debut out of the Contender Series Brazil. Ended up catching his fight, his comp, his the level of the comp, his competition was not UFC caliber like some of these other contender series fights. Liked what I saw in there. Moise, Moise, what's his Tiago is great on the ground, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu ace. Striking wise, he's developing at thir- at twenty three years old. He's getting a lot better. Has a bit of power in there, and that really scares me with Dariush at this point in his career. He's no Aaron Hernandez in there. Didn't look like an Aaron Hernandez necessarily. Um, Thiago and Dariush on the ground is a champion, world champion as well. Striking-wise, has an amazing jab in those wrestling transitions as well. Dariush is a top-level wrestler. The thing that we cannot trust with Dariush is his chin anymore. He's in that Ben Saunders range. He's one of those guys that I know Thiago's a lesser fighter in every category other than the gi jiu-jitsu maybe and maybe not even that but Darius just cannot take a punch he doesn't get wobbled he gets flatlined and that's just really scary if it wasn't the run that Darius was just on against 
high level competition. I'd be way more confident in this. I have Darius for the decision. I feel like I should go inside the distance on Darius, but I'm gonna probably stay away from this bout because it's it's that chin. Darius's chin, unfortunately, is too too too. I suspect. think Darius's chin would be okay if he'd move up to 170. He always has a hard time at. He looks like garbage at weigh-ins. I know a lot of the fighters look like garbage, but he is one of those guys that looks like he's on his deathbed at weigh-ins. I just don't even think his, this is his weight class anymore. Or he'd be a perfect example of a guy that might shine in the 165 division UFC. Um, I have Dariush decision here. I just think his experience pays off, and he has been in there against assassins. I, am too, am going to stay away from this fight. Benil isn't one of my favorites. I like him everywhere, but he's just not one of my favorite he, fighters. For me, I feel like I was hyping Dariush for a while there, and it has been three in a row. That Dunham turn loss, that Dunham loss was overturned because Dunham popped on steroids, I believe. Um, but still, uh, Dunham wasn't. Uh, Dariush is at King's MMA, who's notoriously been known for being heavy strikers. Fool I don't me know twice. if they that. <laughs> Shame, Shame on me. <laughs> you can't fool me again. <laughs> <laughs> 8,700 on DraftKings for Dariush against the 7,500 debuting fighter. Do you feel like you're going to have any exposure to Dariush in this Maybe. spot on DraftKings? I don't think I am. I don't think. I think there's so many other fighters that I can get a What's bold What's Dariush's average points? It is 63 points. Ooh, how much is he? Eight. Thousand seven hundred. I can't put him. On Maybe many spots. on one or two. Very low yeah, percentage. Very though. Low. Both fighters low percentage in my opinion. Minus one fifty favorite Darius against the plus one thirty five. I might take a stab at Tiago there. Honestly, I might put him on one. And it's not because I think Darius is a lesser fighter in any sense. It's just that chin. All right. I'm just gonna stay with what I know. On to the forty fivers. We're really getting a lower weight profile bout this entire night out of Denver. They're going to get a treat. It's just because we had DC and the Black Beast fought last time. <laughs> They're countering it everything. out. Everything. Yeah. There's a balance. Yes. <laughs> so we go on to Chad Skelly versus debuting Bobby Moffitt. Moffitt being 13-3, and three, winning his contender series fight against Jacob Kilburn in submission, Darce Choke, two months ago. Chas Skelly being 17 and 3, long met long in the tooth in the UFC, having over five or six fights now, getting only two losses against Darren Elkins over two years ago, and then last losing to Jason Knight TKO a year five months ago, but beating Groot Smocker in there, also getting a win in there against other caliber fighters, Maximo Mo Blanco. Definitely uh Moffitt again. The trend with these fighters on the contender series. He's a good fighter, but Skelly has just seen way more and higher caliber in there. Chelly, Skelly is an ace on the ground. Striking-wise, he's hurt people striking, and he's fallen a bit to me in that submission uh, jiu-jitsu guys who hurt someone and are like, ooh, I'm a striker now. No, you're not a striker. You're a submission guy. I fall on that. And that's where I feel like some of those losses is, have come for Skelly. Skelly's also been able to get out wrestled a bit. But I don't see Moffitt really doing that as well. Uh, Moffitt, the wolf man, really likes to get it to the ground. I think Skelly has sneaky submissions and can fight off a lot of good submissions on the ground. I think if Moffitt takes it there thinking he's going to have an advantage, I think he's going to notice that there's levels to this game striking-wise. If Moffitt can keep it striking, I think he has a bit better advantage, but I think that after the first round, Moffitt's just going to feel the heat of the lights. The CBD's going to be running high in his blood from that contact tie, and uh, I think Skelly rolls here. I got a submission round number two. Chas Skelly, I'm going to have some exposure here. What do you think about this fight? I also am going to have exposure on Skelly. I have submission round one for him. I think it's going to go a lot like Marais versus, um, what's his, who's his face that just got knocked out last weekend? Um, in the third round? Marais? Florida Burn? guy. Saunders? Killer B. Yeah, Saunders. R remember when Sergio Marais... Oh, showed the... him after the fact, like, this is what you do on the ground. Yeah, Okay. this is going to be that fight. I Except can Chaz Skelly is going to be the Sergio Marais. Right, and right, I think right. afterwards he's going to show Bobby Moffat. Like, there's levels to this game. Um, and as you're saying, those UFC lights is hot. It's hot, and Chaz Skelly's done it a lot of time. Uh, I hope 
The only thing that will be the difference is we have no idea how Ether Guy is at fighting at a mile high Denver. Right. So Definitely I am going to go matter. Skelly submission, and I think it's over. Um, I'm going to put him on like 75% of my cards. So Chess Skelly still at a team takedown. Team takedown was that failed attempt at a super camp uh, ATT style. It's been changed over a few times, but Kelly stayed there for a while. They do have some other UFC caliber fighters in there. Moffitt's coming out of that MMA lab. MMA lab has sneakily, sneakily started to produce top level fighters. Eric Shelton being in there, but not only that, we're seeing a lot of other guys transitioning and doing uh, runs out of there, so... 8,400 on DraftKings for Skelly against 7,800 for Moffitt. How much exposure do you think you're going to have to 75%. Kelly? 75%. 75%. I want to say about 70% as well for Skelly in this one. On to, or let's see, what are the actual betting lines? I feel like this one's actually fairly close. We have Skelly as the minus 105 against the minus 115 Moffitt. This is a coin flip of a fight. Oh, I think you put Chaz Skelly on some parlays at that at price. At 105? My, uh, yeah. yeah, even at the minus negative 105, it's like... He's a slight like, underdog there. He should be a, a heavier flip. underdog, in, in, in my opinion. He should Inter be a heavier... But, Skelly's the favorite I on DraftKings. I mean, Skelly should be the heavier favorite. favorite. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. That makes more sense to me as well. Again, Moffitt, Moffitt should be a heavier underdog. MMA lab, young kid. Fun one. Fun one, fun one. Excited for that one. I'm going to actually back off. I'm going to go probably like 60, 55% on that with Skelly. Limit myself maybe a little bit of Moffitt. All right, all right, all right. We got ABC at 115 pounds versus Ashley Yoder. You know how we love Amanda Bobby Cooper. Here... At Lab B, one of the best names in the game. This is a three and four fighter against a five and four. Amanda fighter. Bobby Cooper. Yoder's coming off of a three fight losing streak, being thirty one years old against a twenty seven year old ABC. I, we've seen them both. I don't like either one of them. I don't think I have to go heavy in this fight because there's other ladies' fights along the night that are way funner than this. This to me is a coin flip of a fight. I do think ABC is a better all-around fighter. She can keep it striking if she needs to. Um, Yoder seems to have a little bit lower fight IQ in there. Both of their gas tanks are serviceable. I just feel like on the ground, Bobby Cooper can do enough to just fight off the submissions. I don't see either one putting each other into too much danger here. I got ABC winning a death by a thousand cuts decision, but I'm going to steer so clear away from this one. Do not play it anywhere in my eyes, unless you got a hot read that I'm not seeing. Who do you have in this? It's fight? not worth a ton of points, but Amanda Bobby Cooper, per MMA math, she lost to Mackenzie Dern by a submission, and Yoder went to a decision loss with her. Okay. So per my MMA math, Yoder should submit Amanda Bobby Cooper in round three. She goes to decision in all her fights, and if you look back at the last three of her fights, they are far higher caliber than the losses of uh, ABC, Amanda Bobby Cooper. Angela Magana, that ain't, that ain't a win. That That's like beating the girl at the bar last week. <laughs> that's a good point. That's Cynthia a good point. Calvillo, I know everyone loves her personality, but I've always thought she was overrated, so getting submitted by her is frightening. And Elmos, I don't even know if she's in the UFC anymore. She might be, I don't know. Um... <laughs> Getting submitted by Tatiana Suarez is maybe the best thing Amanda Bobby Cooper's done of recent. So going to decision with uh, Angela Hill and Mackenzie Dern in a split, and a lot of people thought Yoder won, but they just gave it to uh, Fat Dern to uh, push her star along. So, yeah, I got Yoder. Submission round three. I think a sneaky little underdog play, and I won't put it too many places. Sneaky underdog with the... Favorite Ashley Yoder, eight thousand six hundred <laughs> against Amanda Bobby Cooper, seven thousand six hundred. ABC is the slight underdog at plus one twenty five, minus one forty five. Yoder, I feel like the lines are right there. I got another underdog tonight. I think this is again. Uh, do you know where the accolades come for Yoder's background? Is she a sh judoka or a striker? I feel like she has a little bit of that some sort of um olympic experience that i can't bring off the top of my head now i don't know i just know abc ain't for me 
I, I like it. I like she it. She never has been though. I probably could look back and be like, I'm pick I, against I, her. I probably win one, lose one, win one, lose right. one because I never pick her. Once. <laughs> <laughs> never pick her. Again, limited exposure. I could see for myself maybe at that seven thousand six hundred putting ABC as my wager gauger on a couple little spots there. Not much though. Not much at all. There's other spots still. If you haven't liked and subscribed, you better wherever you can on Instagram, Twitter at Lesbo and the Bean. Be sure to, we're moving into the main card. We got six fun ones ahead of us, starting off with Luis Violent Bob Ross Pena against Mike Trezino. This is a fight that was due to take in the tough house. It was supposed to happen, but Luis Pena broke his foot, was unable to fight in there. Trezino coming off of a debut win against who was the guy that got cut after that. One of the worst fights ever. Joe Gianetti winning the tough series. Mike Trezino. This is essentially, for me, the belt holder for that season. Whoever wins this fight. Because Violent Bob Ross got hurt or something. Yeah, he broke his foot in his first fight. 5-0 and Violent Bob Ross. Definitely a Muay Thai striker. Beating Richie Smolin in the UFC as well in his last fight via submission three months ago. Trezino... Likes to wrestle. Likes to take it there. He's coming out of that Tiger Shulman gym. They've had three, four guys in this weight class fight in the last few weeks. So we know that he's got a good training camp. Yeah, and I think him. they've all been winning. Alton Arse didn't win, but he took a... He, he's tough. He's tough. <laughs> Arse. So uh, this is definitely a way bigger step up against Janetti, Or against, other than Janetti, Luis Pena being in there. One of the best guys in the house. You know... Here the Bean has been a big fan of Violent Bob Ross. Love his striking on the ground. He's nasty as hell. Tall, tall fighter at 6'3", 155 pounds. It's unreal that this guy makes weight, but he does it well. Earlier in the week, teasing Luis Pena, saying that he was having a bad day. Luckily, he's still in the fight. He's doing a couple fan-friendly things in Colorado there. I do believe he has local ties. He's fighting out of Cali, but... I feel like I've seen his Instagram. He might be at BMF. Might be making that up there. Trezino, though, likes to wrestle. Get it to the ground. Striking-wise, is a one-two puncher. Pushes you forward against a fence. Brings your legs out from under you. And will pay a little bit of those bongos on the butt cheeks if he needs to. Infamous gift going around there from Trezino's fight. Dana White really being upset with his last fight in there. I don't know if he's being fed to the wolves at all in there. I think this is a perfect stylistic matchup. You know how I'm going. I got Pena here. I think that this is actually st strategistically a play that it hurts me to do. But I'm going to have to stay away from Luis Pena at 9,300 against 6-9 for Trezino. Because I think this is a decision fight. A lot of people see Violent Bob Ross getting him out of there in um, some form or fashion. And I think Trezino is serviceable everywhere. Trezino is one of these guys that makes you look worse than you really are. And I think that that's going to happen here. I still see Luis Pena having a decided decision, maybe even giving up the third round to Trezino, but I see Pena easily taking the first two, if not maybe finishing. I'm steering clear of this one, honestly. It's too high for my blood. I'll put some betting lines on it, cash, but DraftKings-wise, I don't see a play in this fight at all. I actually think there's a play on Trezano. The lone wait, wolf, in my opinion, has a chance at winning this fight. Uh, Luis Pena, the guy he's gone up against, as much as we all like his character and personality, he hasn't gone up against anyone with a record. He's gone up against a guy that zero zero in his last four fights. A guy that a never word. fought anyone before. So I don't even know how good his striking is. It's not like we hear a hot Italian scene. Who's out of Italy? A Vittori? Like, I don't know. Right. So... It just makes me nervous, and I don't want to jump on that, oh, we all like this guy's personality more than his. I think Mike Trezano is going to be like a Brian Barberina, and he's going to be a guy that no one sees come in, and he sneaks up the ranks, kind of like a Boom Kelleher. No one sees him coming, and he just slowly sneaks on through. I really like Luis Pena. I just don't think, at the same time, Violent Bob Ross, we can also have a Sugar Shane. <laughs> we can also have a Zabit. Like, how many of these guys with the exact same personality from a different part of the world are we going to have? The artist with the afro. So, I'm going Trezano decision. 
I like him for the cost, the price, and I'm hoping, like, this is such a your thing to say, he can use his wrestling reverse to stay out of uh, Pena's grip. The thing that could make me change is I have to look at him at weigh-ins and see, there. it says there's a four-inch height advantage on here. Right. I have to see arm length. That's, oh, there's a reach disadvantage for sure. Yeah, like, I want to see everything... Uh, I want to see him standing in front of each other. If Luis Pena is a ton taller and lankier, if he has that same thing that Zabit has going when you watch him stand in front of the other guy where you're like, of course he's good. Yeah. He can just grab yeah. you up and I might Vic you. taught us a very valuable lesson in that, though, as so, well. Um, Trezano decision, I know that's really weird, but I think everyone's so I, high I, on Luis Pena. I think we're saying a bit of the same thing because I'm telling you, 29-28, I see a slight decision, Pena, but I think this is a closer fight for 2000 for minus... 200 minus 270 Luis Pena is the favorite there I think that lines off as well I'm saying that this is a minus 145 favorite Pena in my eyes and I don't think that your underdog play there is a bad play at all I see a wager gauger potentially at 6'9 you're gonna need it because there's a couple of these other people that are also in that 9,000 above 9,000 and the range. only thing I'm worried about with Pena is because he submits so much all the time yep. and it's so fast how d- is he with a full 15 minutes? That's the only thing that makes me go with Trezano decision. The being saying here, third round, I think Trezano gets regardless. And I think he doesn't use, Trezano doesn't use wrestling in reverse. He uses it as a wrestler to just win, try to win a decision. Fun one. That's a funny sneaky fight. That could be a fight in that contender there. People don't even know. Sleeping on that one. On to the next bout. We're moving back into the ladies division. 115 pounds. We have Macy... Mace Barber against Hannah Cipher. We got a double d- debut. D- 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 double debut. Another one. Macy is coming off of that contender series when Kiefer Cipher is coming off of a win eight and two out of the next level fight club against five and one type fighters. I did catch the few fights. For the 8-2 and two fighter, Cypher, limited striker, on the ground, limited wrestling. I don't want to say okay power because the times I saw her knock women down, it was later in the fights and they more put their head in front of her so she could just hit it with anything and when, then they went down, ground and pound came. But I didn't really see uh, Cypher really outclassing anybody on the few fights that I saw where... Macy Barber is the future. Macy Barber is 20 years old. I remember talking about her, about her contender series fight against a 36-year-old fighter champion. She went in there, teed her up in the third round, got a finish with elbows, sliced her apart, went back and watched that. Macy Barber is the real deal. Strikes nonstop. She's a Yair Rodriguez with better submissions in my eyes on the ground for a woman. That makes me nervous. Oh, <laughs> I think, yeah, you're so overrated. But uh, what I mean by with the Yair Send is the she hate throws, to and the bean at gmail.com. She throws a lot of spinning <laughs> and a lot of kicks in general. But on the ground, I think she's better than Yair, has better take down the fence. I just like everything I'm seeing for Macy. I see this being a one-sided fight all the way over. This is a fighter that I'm trying to use those Trezinos at 6'9". To get on there because at 9,400, I feel like she's worth it. This is a finish round number one. Wow. If not, okay. If not, this is a three round beating where it's still 130 points because this is the type of output that Macy throws out there. She doesn't stop moving forward. She throws, she's in the clinches throwing elbows, and she's one of those type of fighters where she just moves. Is it because the ladies she's gone against have like a 1 0 record and a 1 1 record? That does help, but she does, she's coming out of. She also has a extensive background in, I don't know if it's, I can't remember, Kyokushin Karate. She has a big upbringing being a martial artist. I, yeah. You love her. I love her. I think that she is the future. All right. I'm listening to you on it, and I'm putting Macy Barber, KO round two. I'm giving the other girl a little credit just because she's gone against women with a lot more record. Uh... I'm int- I'm excited. I've never watched her fight, so I don't have anything to say. Barbara, about you it. no cipher. You mean you've never seen? No. Right, right, right. Because Barbara, I remember we were we were like, whoa, she beat that lady. <laughs> she beat her. Watch that fight again. 
just the forward pressure for Barber. Later on, it's going to get, it, she's going to have tougher fights. I don't necessarily think this is one of them from the limited footage that I was able to see still. Again, 9,400 against the 6'8". Heavy favorite also on the betting lines, Barber being minus 430. I'm going to still put her on a couple parlays. I just, I don't see it. I don't see where Cypher wins this. I'm going with Barber too. I like it. I like the enthusiasm. It's, it <laughs> sells me over. It's almost like a that's like two or three hundred percent. You've given I agree us with today. that. That never happens. That doesn't happen. That doesn't. But there's squash matches on this card. Said that earlier on the night. There's a. Hey, there is. I just. I'm telling you what I see. And I think a lot of people think that Pena is one of those squash matches. And I think they were surprised when we said it was that it's not. Pena is a little too little too favorited there. On to the 125ers, we have a profile fight here with Joey B, Joseph Benavides against Ray Wait, Ford. don't skip. God dang it, no. Uh, isn't it Rocky Pennington and Jermaine Deronomy? Oh, you skipped it. No, mine goes Macy Barber right to Rocky Pennington and Jermaine. Don't tell me Joey B fell out with Ray Borg. Yeah, I don't have that on my list at all. I got a DraftKings card for it, too. It's not on tap at all. Look at Look at mine. Bink and then look Bink. At, what? Look at. Maybe you look at your Twitter while I break it down in case it's still on. Okay. I'll get into it real quick. Hopefully this didn't fall out. Hopefully all, hopefully all of the glasses out of Ray Borg's eye by now. So he had to drop out at 11 and 3 out of his last fight due to that Conor McGregor incident over a year ago. But he's also had, as we were saying before, a lot of issues with his child, which has kept him out of fighting. The Taz Mexican Devil likes to get it in there, mix it up all around. Great fighter. Joseph Benavidez is a staple at 25 and 5, only losing to top level other than Sergio Pettis. Sergio Pettis is a split decision loss for Joey B in there. And. As we were saying before with Joey B and Sergio Pettis, maybe it wasn't Sergio being as good as he is and Joey B just having a ton of fights. He's jumped around. He was an alpha male stable, but I know that Joey B has a very fluid relationship with a lot of California teams, a lot of TJ teams Bad as well. Bad news from UFC Denver. Medical issues have ruled Ray Borg out of the fight with Joey Joseph Benavidez, and the contest has been scrapped. Ow! New bow order still being finalized. Are you kidding me? So, Thank you, late breaking here at Lab B. Yeah, like really 45 minutes ago. Ray um, Borg ruled out a fight against Joey Benavidez. It's because I haven't closed my tap card from all the study work I've been, or all the studying I was doing for this. So I'm sure if I refresh it, it's going to be, woo! Come on! <laughs> Come on, Ray Borg! And I said, Ray Borg, did you, <laughs> I didn't know that it was Ray Borg. I was just making fun of his eye. <laughs> I know, it is really Ray Borg. Dang it! Do you think short notice, three days, four days? I think they might fill it. I think they might fill it because it says um, new bout order still being finalized. Okay. So Joey B in there, I just got to be, you got to worry about that chin at all. But with this short of notice, he should be able to beat a lot of people in there. Ugh. You definitely better be following at Zul tonight on Twitter or at Weakneck Baby. Also at Lesbo and the Bean to be getting that late breaking news because once there's about four Joey B if he gets one, we'll, we'll tell you how I feel and about you never it on know. Twitter. We could be hey you guys, uh, we're gonna come out with another show. We're gonna do something on YouTube. We're gonna do something on you never know. Yeah, so if you follow us, you'll get the latest breakingest shit, and it's always for free, you guys. True. Jeez, all Truth. you have to do is like and follow. That's it. Hit the bell. Ain't that hard? It'll take two seconds. So. We move on to Raquel Pennington versus GDR, the Iron Woman. Some people that I know have called her not so Iron Woman. Taking a four year, five year hiatus. Soft lady. <laughs> Seven and three. Iron Lady is 34 years old, coming off of a decision win oh, for the belt over a year, eight months ago, against Holly Holmes at what? What was that about at 135 pounds? Raquel Pennington being 9-6, and six, losing to only top caliber in there. Her last loss five months ago to Amanda Noon's TKO. 
Pennington came off of that knee issue. Didn't look like it affected her all that much in the fight, but she did. She's never been the most forward or most athletic fighter. Pennington has a ton of power in there. Likes to keep it striking. Has a heavy right hand. On the ground, uses a wrestling in reverse. On the ground, we've really not seen much at all. And GDR doesn't shoot in there. This is going to be a striker's delight, as we like to call it here at Lat V. And GDR, you know what you got to wait for. That bell to ring for the most damage to happen in a fight. Twice in one fight. Twice. Two late hits, and they were the most dev devastating strikes of that fight. Backstage, there's a photo of Ronda Rousey giving her money. Are you joking me? I'm kidding. Oh, I was like, <laughs> The WWE money's coming in. <laughs> she paid her off to do that late <laughs> strike. So, GDR knows what to do. She's a Muay Thai striker, Dutch striker specifically. Really loads up on that left hand. She has a piston of a left hand. As much shit as we talk about GDR, she's also a woman who has fought men and won in there. In mixed matches over in Europe. GDR is a beast in there. We like to talk crap because she's taken a step back, decided to be a cop, and now come back. Because that's what she was doing in the Netherlands... Or I forget where in the... LAPD. In the, no, it wasn't in the States for sure. <laughs> but um, she's definitely coming back. In this, it's gonna... I see it being a striking battle. If, if Raquel Pennington had even any type of takedowns in any fights, I would pick her here. But she doesn't. So she's going into a fight into a striker's den. This is what G GDR does. GDR beat Holly Holm in a decision... I feel like that's going to be more of the same here. I agree. Her best strikes were after the after bell. After the bell. I think there's a low output fight either way. I don't think there's many takedowns. I don't think there's many strikes. I think they stand in front of each other. And the person who gets hit a bit more all the way around is Raquel Pennington. GDR has good head movement in there. Getting that Dutch kickboxing. I got GDR decision. I'm going to probably stay away from this. I see it being super low scoring. If there's a finish on one side of this fight... I think it's GDR instead of uh, Raquel. Raquel got her nose broken, if I remember correctly, not long ago. Oh, she got fucking brutalized in her last fight. Brutalized. The only thing good that Rocky has going in this fight, in my opinion, is her girlfriend. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> is the fact that she actually lives at elevation. And good so call. she's going to have the better cardio here. Uh, other than that, I think Jermaine's better everywhere, and I actually like that Jermaine's taking this much time off. When a fighter takes this much time off, there's a reason for it. Also, coming from AKA, this is very normal that we see them take this much time off. Unless you're Dan Daniel Cormier, you might take two years off. It's Cain Velasquez, Luke Rockhold, all these guys. They Hopefully, they're letting their injuries heal, and mm -hmm. that's why they're gone for so long. I think GDR is just a little better everywhere, and... You know I love Misha Misha Tate, but that victory at the time that it came for her, Misha was already done. She was already done for, and so Rocky just kind of cleaned up on what the damage that Amanda had already done. And uh, I got GDR decision. I, th I can see that if the finish comes, it is out of GDR's hands. I love Rocky more, but GDR wins this fight. I think it's 8,800 on DraftKings against 7,400 for Darren Dame. Darren Dame also being the minus 165 favorite. I think that all that is spot on. I think the line is right here. I think a little high on DraftKings for 8,800. You pretty much need a finish in there. I do think that this should she should be maybe in that 85, 84. Rocky might have the better cardio and she might have the better ground game. But so, when did she use it? I don't know. Exactly. But I don't know. I just, for the cost, she might be a good person to put on your card to fill your card with meat. Wage gauge because of the decision? Yeah. I thought we had other, I I was, I like Trezino. I think Trezino is the wage gauge. I think I'm that's good too. That. I just, um, you, the cost of yeah. the winners uh, of this fight. Specifically DraftKings wise. Mm -hmm. Totally. Or even Parlay. Oh, so you think that Raquel can get a win in there? I think the longer it goes, the better it is for Raquel, in my opinion. I can see that. I can see that. 
And elevation if you look Elmo's, point. pretty much if I look and I see Elmo's on your um, record of people you beat, <laughs> I'm like... Gotta look back. Hmm. Gotta look back. On to the co-main event. These ele- these Another elevation fighter, Donald Cowboy Cerrone coming in at 170 pounds against Mike Platinum Perry. You know Cerrone's going to have that cardio. Been out of Colorado for a long time. The local favorite. Do you think the judges side here? with the local guy or did he does that matter in colorado we know the elevation matters mm. how are the judges in general out here do they tend to screw i don't the know pooch? i don't know if we um we know the illuminati built their airport but i don't know what they're <laughs> judging <laughs> <laughs> um have you just uh, different podcasts definitely <laughs> so interesting thing with this fight we've seen that these guys being here multiple, multiple times. 12-3 and three for Mike Perry getting his last win three months ago to Paul Felder in a nasty split decision. Paul Felder breaking his arm in there, still being able to go to decision. Prior to that, Griffin, Max Griffin was able to beat Mike Perry in Orlando, his hometown. Ponzinibbio also got it done in there. Donald Cerrone, one of the most tenured fighters now, 33-11, and 11, being on a... Big losing streak, getting a win in there against a failing fighter in Yancey Medeiros, and then losing to Leon Edwards in a decision his last fight. Cowboy is fought a lot less than he usually does. I believe this is only a second fight this year. Usually he's about four times a year, but at 35 years old on a long fight career, Cerrone doesn't come in and blow you out. He's one of these guys that needs second and third round, five rounds benefits Donald Cerrone. Three rounds doesn't. Three rounds benefits Mike Perry because Perry tends to gas in there. He really starts to limit up those strikes to one and two punch combinations in those third and fourth rounds. Also, Mike Perry doesn't check too much those leg kicks. Griffin really exploited that leg kick because when I went back and looked at the tape, everything was thrown off of Perry's game plan by that front leg being kicked out. Now with the changes that might happen here. Perry ended up going to, if there's somebody who knows how to fight Donald Cerrone, it's Jackson Wink. Donald Cerrone has fought there for years. They've watched him for years fight everybody. They know how to beat Donald Cerrone. And if you don't know the backstory, the quick version. Donald Cerrone used to fight there. Mike Perry came on. They got the fight. Mike Perry wasn't necessarily asked to come back on. Since then... Don Cerrone's talked a lot of shit, or not talked shit, just said how that gym isn't producing good fighters because they're having their pros fight anybody literally at any time, and it doesn't make sense. And then you see Jackson Wink also allow some really gnarly footage to be shot in their gym. John Jones comes out of there. Holly Holmes comes out of there. We see other fighters have some other speckled stuff. Mike Perry, is he thriving at Jackson Wink? Or is he hurting himself on the social media game with all his Chief Cerrone cowboy stuff going on there? Did that all make sense? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot. Yeah. You have to be keeping so, up with a lot of things here. Cowboy Cerrone fought at Jackson Wink for a very long time. Jackson or Wink, what one? I c- can't think of the specific one that they're having problems with um, right now. Yeah, so one of them got into a fight with Cowboy and said he's not a team player anyway yep. and he never even comes here to warm up. He's like on his own schedule. He never helps the other fighters warm up, so F him. Because um, Mike Perry was there too. And Cowboy's like, hey, you shouldn't be training Mike Comfort Perry. I've been interest. here forever. You shouldn't be training us both. And they're like, you're not even here. And we need the money. So they kept training Mike Perry. Cowboy got pissed. He has his own little part. I mean, he's had the BMF, BMF ranch, ranch forever. forever. The, like... Uh, Bad motherfucking ranch. Um, he has a last fight card. We just had Lando Venata fight out of there. A bunch of good Paul guys. Paul Felder fights out of there. Yep. He good, he cross trains with so Cerrone cross trains with Elevation as well. And Dillashaw then what else you're guys. talking about? If you listen to all the shows, you also know because you have talked about it on the show. Mike Perry dressing up as a Native American in a full headdress and everything, and blah blah blah. I actually think the John Jones trouble that Jackson Wink has. Stayed loyal, stuck by John the whole time through all that BS. I think it sets him up nice to handle a guy like Mike Perry before he goes off the rails. Another wild man? Yeah, I think he actually call. could be. Like maybe They've learned a, a lot from man. that. And, oh, um, uh, the karate hottie. 
She fights out of there too. They have so oh, many they, fighters. I was, she fights out of there. Everybody fights, or has been there for three or four months and then moves on to something else. But um, in this fight, I mean, we're seeing a diminished Donald Cerrone here. We're not seeing a top level Donald Cerrone. What I really like with Mike Perry in all this is early on in the pressers. Mike Perry was saying, I want to be friendly because I've heard that Don Cerrone fights the best when he's friendly. I love that Perry's saying that and doing that because uh, he thinks it's fun and funny, but go ahead and bite off more than you can chew. Go ahead and give Donald Cerrone every optimal advantage he needs because if there's anything Donald Cerrone has, it's a big bag of tricks that will turn on in the second and third round where Perry tends to slow down. For me, I got a dirt Cerrone decision here. I think he takes wow. round two and three. I know Perry is a big favorite for that big power coming out of Winkle John or Jackson Wink. I mean, Cerrone, though, I think again, he knows he's going to give up that first round. I see him coming back, if not taking this to the ground where Cerrone has a huge advantage. Mike Perry doesn't fight on the ground. It's hard to get Mike Perry to the ground. He's a very stocky, strong guy with solid wrestling. Uh, but I think Cerrone can even sink in the hooks from behind and get on his backing, submit him at some point in time. I think as the go rounds go on, Cerrone turns it up. I got a decision. Give me Donald Cowboy underdog Cerrone. That is a pretty good underdog. I mean, Paul Felder went to a split decision and he's fighting with Donald Cerrone with at With a broken BMF. arm in the second round. Um... Yeah, he has the better ground game for sure. Four months ago for Cerrone with Leon Edwards. Decision. Getting knocked the bunk out by Darren Till, uh, which I feel like Cerrone has that kind of Darren Till power. Uh, Robbie Lawler going to decision with him. I think Robbie Lawler is dizzy, done. And we haven't seen Jorge in there really doing his thing in years. Yancey Medeiros, same thing to be said about him. He's not looking great over his last few fights. So losing, I don't love Leon Edwards. I actually think Mike Perry is just the future where Cowboy Cerrone is just the past. And that is the only reason. It's not because any of Mike Perry's wins are against even close to the caliber of fighter that Cowboy's gone against. And Mike Perry's personality is getting him to this place way more than his skills inside the octagon at this point. But going to decision with Max Griffin, we saw him just get beat the F Pick up the, the whole time by Max Griffin. And then we also saw um, Pons and Hebio just pick, pick him, him apart. apart. Cerrone can do that. I just think... He is the right skills, uh, or the right athlete at the right camp. So, yeah, Felder's training with uh, Cerrone Elevation, at his yep. camp, but Jackson Wink is training uh, Platinum, and they know everything about Cowboy. Everything. Every detail, every loophole, everything. They have masters watching tape all the time. Also at Elevation. I'm pro Jackson Wink right now, and I've kind of been fading Cowboy for a little while now. Totally. I'm going to keep fading Cowboy. I think Perry's on his way up. I think we watch him in a lot a lot of brutal fights for a lot of years to come. Mike Perry ekes out a decision. I like your underdog play there, though. I like it. Donald Cerrone is the plus 195 underdog against the minus 230 favorite for Perry. I think a lot of people see Perry blowing Cerrone out of there. And if he doesn't, it is a dog fight. This is a club way closer than I think they have it. think uh, I have a lot of underdogs tonight. It's testament at to how fun of a fight card this is going to be. You I heard it here first. It's going to be a really fun fight card. You heard it here first. We finally made it to the main event. Profiled at 145 pounds. We have Chan Sung Jung, the Korean zombie, coming in against... Yeah, ear Rodriguez. Rod and like you were saying, though, about Cowboy, how they're being friends, and you're like, go ahead, give them extra. Everything. I don't think they're being friends at all. I actually think this is going to be the most emotional Cowboy has ever been inside there. Ooh, and that's I like the it. dangerous spot for Cowboy. Interesting. This is, it is pretty short notice, but do we need to let no. Alpaca know about this and be like, what do you feel about Perry's specific mind games in this situation? 
Um, no, I don't even think it's the mind games. I think it's just where Cowboy has taken it, talking shit because on Joe Rogan Jackson about Wink. Jackson Wink's gym. Uh, okay. So I think it's even heavier emotion than like Diaz inside the octagon talking shit. I think there's a weighted emotion that's been keeping him up at night. I think it's different. And I don't think Cowboy is great under those yep. stresses. 8,900 real quick on DraftKings for 7,300 for Cerrone. I think we didn't, we skipped <laughs> these lines. I could put them equal. I could put them equally on cards. I see Cerrone playing a little bit more for 7-3. He's going to give me those shots. Oof, I don't see myself playing him because more. I think two or three a piece. Yeah, like, I'm going to say 60% on Donald Cerrone. But Perry, I'm not going to put that much. I don't see the finish coming. As I was saying before, at 145, the Korean Zombie versus Yair Rodriguez. 14 and 4, the Korean Zombie is 31 years old but had a long career in the UFC at he had to take a little break in there. Was it him for the uh, military? Because he has a fight against Aldo over five years ago and then fought two or a year, nine months ago, beating Dennis Bermudez via TKO, where he's had big lapses in between due to injuries. I believe that Aldo fight, he actually dislocated his shoulder and then Jose Aldo knocked him out with kicks to the body because of that shoulder injury. La Pantera is 10-2, and two, only losing in the UFC to Frankie Edgar and a beating Dr. Stoppage over a year five months ago due to that eye swelling up. Yair likes to throw some of that spinning shit in there. He's a very Lando Venata. I would say Barber, where the difference in Barber is that uh, she actually has a really, really slick ground game where Yair is more opportunistic on the ground. Where Chain Sung Jung... On the ground, I don't think Yair is going to be able to submit it. Chan Sung Jung has good wrestling. On the ground, good control. Yair throws up a lot of that mission control. I know you tend to like a lot of that. Um, and he gets there because he throws that spinning shit. And a good wrestler is going to come in on those hips, eventually get him there. I don't necessarily see Chan Sung Jung doing that. His entries to his takedown are really limited. He tends to knock you down to get you there more than anything instead of actually setting up a good takedown. And against Yair, that's hard to do. His striking defense is very Taekwondo-esque, so his head sits back very, very hard, so it's hard to get inside the pocket in there and really land. Where Yair, where Frankie Edgar was able to really uh, neutralize, Yair was pushing him up against the fence and putting his back on the wall. I don't think Chan Sung Jung can do that at any point in time in this fight. I think these guys are going to square off in the middle of the ring, and eventually, Yair's spin and stuff is going to keep adding up. I see this being a TKO stoppage round number two or three wow. for Yair. I just think this is a fade on the Korean zombie. He's been hurt a lot in his career, had a lot of time off against a lot of older fighters. I think this is a humongous step up. Bermudez, that TKO, look at how Bermudez always gets hurt in every single one of his fights. And it was only a matter of time until Bermudez starts getting his lights shut out in there. In my point of view, I like Yair a lot here. I think Chan Sung Jung is in a really fadeable spot, in my point of view. I think it was a fluke last time I'm fading Bermudez's chin as much as I am the Korean zombie. Give me Yair everywhere. Wow. I have Jung submission round three. I want to stay away from this fight. I don't like Yair Rodriguez. I don't like him at all. I think he's so highly overrated, and I think his Andre Feely head kick was a fluke. Everything after that, it's like Alex Caceres went in there who always has a garbage game plan and looks sloppy as shit in there, and they just look like two sloppy shit spinning around at each other with barely minimal damage. Neither of them looked great, and he won a split decision that other people could have seen it go the other way easily so then he beats bj Penn, who we say over and over again he ha shouldn't have been fighting totally. that fight still so then he goes in and he gets murked he got murked by frankie edgar in the exact same fashion that in my opinion Derek lewis murked the black beast it's exactly what I thought was going to happen. It, there's levels to this game, and when you go in against a guy that's that many levels above you, that is what's going to happen. 
I don't know if the Korean zombie, the OG Korean zombie, because they ever, I like how every Korean guy that comes out of Korea, they're like, we should call him the Korean zombie. Well, it's because they all were watching the Korean zombie when he was 21, 22 in WEC and UFC. Like, he's yeah. been around for a so, bit. So, uh, I, it, it might be smart of the UFC to do Yair and try to build his name. I just don't see them doing Yair any favors. Especially after that whole Zabit falling yes. out, being and something mental up. about that. I hope in between time, if for some reason there's an interview in between time, and I hear that Yair Rodriguez had sports psychology in between, I'll switch my cards to him. But there's something mental over the physical part of Yair that is shaky for me, mm -hmm. and so I'm gonna go with Jung submission round three. Um, I know you. He may not use his submission, but I don't think Yair has anything on the ground. Uh, uh, um, but I'm not going to put it too many places. Korean Zombie, 8,500 on DraftKings against a 7,700 for Yair. Betting favorite, minus 140. Wow, I'm surprised. I thought Korean Yair zombie, would be the favorite. I would too. So I'm really surprised. Another underdog for the bean. Main event in a finish. I see myself putting Yair in a few spots there. If I see a second round finish... I like what I see. I like it a lot. I think there's money to be made tonight. If you're following along, you better be making it. There's going to be some props posted on the Beans account on Twitter at Zoltanite. I guarantee it because there's just too much juice. The juice is loose this card for we'll me. We'll have our cards up. Our final cards will be also up on our Twitter. So if you're not following us yet, make sure you do. I need to start putting the cards. I have to remember to put them on Instagram too for the people that follow us on Instagram. Blah, 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 blah. What? We got to go over the wager gauger and do we have an underdog of the night real quick before we leave the, the fans just so that we can narrow it down. What I we know, both settled I with. just There's have so many. no, I, I feel like what we say about them during them is, is them now because since Leslie Smith, it just, I feel like even picking an underdog jinx is my card. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like okay. some of them we agree we, we say our rounds totally. we say our thing um if the longtime fans and the people that are nerdy nerdy betters and they should know all of our tells that they know when to put money on it unless they're and I think we say it about it during the fight like oh yeah this is a good wager gauger where you even are like I like that other guy fucking better I don't even remember what Trezino one yeah Trezino I love that I love there it that. is wager gauger Find the other spots where you are. Interact where you can. I, got I know, and fans else. are going to write me and say, No, I like it. You guys have to pick an underdog. Because <laughs> that's Can't how fan voices you are. But, <laughs> but you get what you need. <laughs> Make sure you like and subscribe. Let's go to me. Thanks for listening to Lat B. For all things Lesbo and the Bean, head over to lesboandthebean.com or follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter.